Okay, well, um, hello comrades, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon what time zone you're in. It's great to see you all here. Um, the discussion, the, win, the Workers International Network discussion this week is on the economic consequences of the war in Ukraine. And of course, this has got huge implications for people all over the world, um, not just the terrible suffering of Ukrainian civilians and soldiers and Russian soldiers. Um, Russia is a key supplier of oil, gas, wheat, metals, fertilizer, platinum, copper, nickel to many other countries of the world who rely. The world, the world compared to the beginning of the Second World War, when incidentally my dad left Poland with the Polish army as a refugee in the way that um, people are leaving the Ukraine today. In, in comparison to, those, to that period 80 years ago, the world is far more integrated economically and far more dependent upon trade, exchange of goods, um, the interconnection between industries that uh, operate and produce in different parts of the world. Um, China's plan for the development of its trade with Europe relies heavily on uh, political and economic stability in areas like Ukraine and Russia, land routes through, through uh, Russia to Europe and so on. Ports in the Black Sea have been closed, which has shut off exports from southern Russia to places like North Africa that rely heavily on, um, on, on uh, wheat supply, uh, food supply. Um, war is the midwife of revolution, as Marx was famous for saying. And um, not least of all, that is because war creates such terrible economic havoc. Um, Michael Roberts, who of course follows the economic developments with a far more expert eye than most of us, he's, he's author of The Long Depression, Marxism and the Global Crisis of Capitalism, and he's um, the, um, the kind of uh, main man in, in the blog, The Next Recession. Michael is going to speak to us on this topic, and then it's going to be open for questions and discussion and people's ideas. Michael, how long would you like to speak for? Well, Ed, I don't think I should speak for more than half an hour. It's all way long enough for anybody, but of course you'll have to probably pull me in right. and make sure I keep to that. You're going, you're going for about half an hour. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you some reminders, Michael. Okay. It's over to you. Well, uh, thanks for inviting me again to uh, win and uh, I'm on on an occasion which, uh, well, it is really quite an amazing development we've had, a dangerous and horrific development we've had since I last uh, was on win, uh, the Ukraine-Russian conflict or the invasion by Russia of Ukraine. And what I want to deal with, as Ed said, is the economic foundations and consequences of this war, uh, not only for Ukraine and Russia, but for the world in general. And as is my want, I shall try to share some graphs with you. Hopefully I can do that. No, nope, I can't. I've not been able to do so. Host needs to make me so, if they can. Um, um, uh, oh, sorry, I think I need to, just one second, yeah, sorry. Um, You just have to make me a co-host or something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to do that. Oh, hey, you are. Okay, I've got you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, just one second. Yeah. Okay. Done. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just get the right one. Um... Okay. So... 
I open with a little quote here, which came out just a few days ago from the INF in their statement, the chief of the INF, Kristalina Georgieva, who said, the war in Ukraine is like a powerful earthquake that will have ripple effects throughout the global economy, especially in poor countries. And that uh, is clearly what this is, another shock uh, coming out of the world capitalist system. And we've had several of those, as I will briefly cover. Now, the latest one now is this war between Russia and Ukraine. What is this conflict about? Well, if you were to read the media, the uh, media in all the countries, particularly of the so-called West, uh, Ukraine is fighting for democracy against autocratic control uh, by Russia, or Ukraine is fighting for national independence against uh, suppression of that by Russia. And NATO is a force for democracy and freedom against the autocratic powers like China and Russia. In addition, perhaps, this war has been started by Putin, who's gone mad, like Hitler or Stalin. And in contrast, Ukraine is fighting under a heroic leadership under President Zelensky, similar to Winston Churchill in the battle against the Nazis in the Second World War. Is any of those statements or positions true? In my view, pretty much none of them. Uh, because when we really consider it from a Marxist point of view, we're considering from a materialist conception of history, not about what individuals are like, whether they're mad or not, whether they're making the right decisions or not, whether they're psychologically out of control or not. We look more at not individuals' actions, although that's relevant, but at the material and forces and interests, particularly class interests, which drive um, individuals, political leaders, governments, into taking certain action or decisions. As Marx said, and Engels said, history has been a history of class struggle. That's what history is really about. The struggle between classes uh, over the material interests that they require and fight for. And that is when we look at wars as well, we can, underneath all the superficial arguments is the key question of what form of class struggle is this taking? Who, whose interest is this war taking place? So I'll look at the economics, but as we can see, economics can't be divorced from politics. Each plays on the other. And as Engels said in the last analysis, history, however, is driven by the material conditions. And Lenin put it in perhaps more uh, succinctly. When we're looking at politics, it's really concentrated in economics. What that means is underneath the political positions and decisions and actions and policies presented by leaders and individuals lies the question of the economics, and in particular, the material interests of the owners of the means of production, the capitalist class and their allies. Just briefly to give you a view about the three key laws of Marxist economics, because I think if we just remember those, it will help us to understand the economic processes going on. Namely, Marx said that capitalism really is based on the law of value. In other words, capitalists produce things and services that people's need, people need uh, using the labor power of human labor, uh, but only producing those things if they make profits. They don't produce things that people need uh, just for the sake of it, and they will not produce them unless profits is involved. And the second law is that in order to uh, increase production and uh, the capitalists will try attempt to accumulate profits in both financial and uh, productive assets, factories, offices, machines, technology in general, and also the financial power behind that. So profits are accumulated and built up in these form of assets. And that law of accumulation is a fundamental feature of capitalist uh, mode of production. And finally, the law of profitability, Namely, as I say, profits is the driving force of investment. But what Marx shows in his analysis of capitalist production, that actually capitalism has an Achilles heel. And that Achilles heel is that it cannot sustain the profitability of investment over time. There is a tendency for that profitability to fall. And this puts uh, capitalism in the position of uh, leading to regular and recurring crises, sometimes of very severe nature, which threaten the whole basis of the capitalist mode of production. 
But not only uh, is capitalism a system of exploitation of human labor for profit, it is also a system of battle between companies and national states for a share of those profits. And there's a drive for technological superiority in trade, finance, and military power internationally. And that is the fundamental driving force of uh, international struggles on trade and finance, and also on leading to the wars between uh, countries, capitalist countries, and so on. And in the modern era of capitalism, we can talk about imperialism, because imperialism is the result of those three laws, the law of profitability, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall over time, drives capitalists in their home economies to look abroad, to counteract the fall in rate of profit, so we get a massive expansion from, particularly from the late 19th century to now, in spreading the capitalist mode of production around the world through capital export, through expansion of uh, investment abroad, and through trade, international trade, which leads to the transfer of profit from the more technologically organized countries uh, and companies from the weaker ones, ones that don't have that same level of technological development. Imperialism is uh, the latest stage or the highest stage of capitalism, where it's no longer just based on nas national states, but on the drive for profitability around the world. And that profitability to be increasingly and exclusive in the hands of a very small number of uh, multinational companies and uh, national states. And one of the driving force behind that is the inability of capitalism to sustain a high rate of profit over a very long period. Here's a, a measure of the world rate of profit by various measures that we'll go into now, which shows the increasing difficulty that capitalism has had internationally since the end of the Second World War to sustain a high rate of profit. We have the big profitability crisis of the middle 1960s, 70s, a, a mild recovery and in the Neoliberal period, we've lived through this period and how awful that was, but that is, capitalism uh, has applied super exploitation of the workers, international uh, exploitation, deregulation, and privatization of state and public services in order to drive up the profitability of capital. A limited a success in doing that. But since in the 21st century, the first two decades of the 21st century, the pressure, the downward pressure on the rate of profit continues. And then that is, in my view, increasing the internecine conflict between the imperialist powers and between those powers that don't follow the policies of imperialism and also uh, the struggle between capitalists and workers internationally. The well, other we have very nearly 10 minutes. OK, uh, let me just move on then to where we are now in the case of Ukraine's economy. It's a disaster, this war. As Ed was saying earlier, we've seen a dramatic uh, collapse in the Ukrainian economy. And I'm just talking about, of course, the deaths of, and the thousands of people, millions of people now driven uh, in as refugee status. Three million have had, have had to leave the country. Another six million have been displaced from their homes and moved around the country, but also the economy has completely collapsed. Uh, the tentative projection now for the recurring, uh, reduction in GDP is at least 10% in 2022, and that assumes that the war does not last long. The IMF reckons that the downside risks are much higher than that. And uh, if we compare that to the collapses in GDP for Ukraine in the uh, post maiden wars of 2014-2015 in eastern Ukraine, a similar fall, but the IMF warns that uh, real GDP contraction, if we look at other countries that suffered prolonged wars, suggests that the annual output contraction could even be as high as 25 to 35 percent in Ukraine. And if we turn to Russia, we can see Russia is facing a similar collapse in its economy, partly because of the sanctioned weapon. As the French finance minister said, we are now waging a total economic and financial war against Russia, Putin, and his government. And you can see on the right here, a graph by the International, uh, Interna International Finance Federation, in which they argue 
that given the collapse in the economy of those domestically and with trade and finance and the blocking of everything possible, particularly the financial reserves of the Russian central bank, we could see that a drop in Russian GDP of something like 15% this year, taking GDP in Russia back to the beginning of the 21st century in levels. This new sanctions weapon is something which has been developed over the last 100 years. A recent book by Nicholas Mulder explains this process why European imperialism used it in order to uh, control and weaken the ability of people to live out what was called the, outside the civilized world. But the Americans have used it as a major weapon in their establishment of global power in the 20th century, uh, relying on not just on military dominance and not just on Cold War politics, but also on use of financial and economic sanctions to control resistant and recalcitrant powers around the world against American imperialism. And as Ed said, the uh, global dimension of this war is spreading wide. Ukraine supplies about 12% of the world's imports, 16% of maize and 40% of sunflower oil, according to the US. And this conflict is going to reduce living standards everywhere as energy and food prices have already rocketed before the full impact of this war hits. If you take a country like Egypt, where 105 million people live in a country which is the largest importer in the wheat of the world and takes most of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia, and see a dramatic increase in all the commodities produced uh, in price and produced by Russia and Ukraine, which has led to a sharp rise there. And this increase in price is going to affect prices and is already affecting prices in energy, food, and other minerals across the world. And this is the measure of the total, if you like, a, a uh, overall picture of commodity price increases. Uh, from uh, the uh, Food and uh, International Organization, which shows that global raw material prices are now at the highest level they've been in the 21st century as a result of the recent developments. And just taking Britain alone, uh, the Bank of America reckons that the invasion of Ukraine could further hike global energy prices and cut real incomes by as much as 3% uh, this year, which will be the biggest drop in real disposable income for British households since 1956, the year of the Suez crisis. And of course, that, that 3% is an average. It will be much higher for lower income fam families who spend so much more on essentials like energy and food than richer households. That's just the UK. Of course, it's much worse in many cases in other countries. Overall, the OECD just presented a report this week, which it says that if the war continues for much longer, global growth will be reduced by one percentage point. Well, global growth is gonna be about three and a half to 4%, they estimated before all this. That means about 25% of global growth is gonna be knocked off. On the other hand, inflation is gonna increase by another two percentage points above a level of four or five that was already predicted. We're heading towards very high levels of inflation in prices over the next year. And that is if the war doesn't continue for too long, but of course, if it continues for even longer, it will have a bigger and bigger effect upon the global economy. Longer term, I just want to mention that what this demonstrates is that we've entered a period in the 21st century where the great era of globalization, of the expansion of finance and trade, as I suggested before, as a measure of trying to cope with the fall in profitability, the expansion of imperialist interests around the world has stalled. And that's happened in the 21st century as, as uh, profitability has fallen globally, as investment has slowed, as trade has slowed, and by increasing protectionist measures by governments, the Trump period of government was an example against China. And you can see on this graph a flattening out of trade and the end, really, of globalization in the 21st century, at least for now. And you'll, as I also pointed out, a sharp increase in the burden of debt for non-financial companies, exclude the banks and the financial institutions, look at the productive sectors of the capitalist economy, which is the uh, non-financial sector, and you can see a significant rise in debt uh, from December 2007, if you look on the right there, uh, on the left there, to 70% of GDP in the case of 
US now 85%, um, increases across the board, both in advanced economies and emerging economies as debt has risen. That can only put huge pressure on very weak companies, which exist now, something like 15 to 20% of companies in the major economies are basically uh, not making enough money to cover the interest and their debt repayments. And if that's going to increase and the pressures of uh, interest rates rising for the central banks raise rates to cope with inflation, then we could see a serious uh, corporate uh, financial crisis in many of the major economies. Liberal economist Sir Martin Wolf, who has stood for uh, the, what is all good in the world from capitalism, now says, only in the last week, that a new world is born, hope for peaceful relations is fading. No one knows what will happen, but we do know this looks like a disaster. A combination of war, supply shocks, high inflation is destabilizing the world. Financial instability now seems like a prolonged bout of stagflation, that is no growth plus high inflation, seems certain with long, large potential effects on financial markets. In the long term, he says, the emergence of two blocks with deep splits between them is likely as an accelerating reversal of globalization and the sacrifice of business interest to geopolitics. Even nuclear war is conceivable. What does he mean by two blocks? He means, the block of the NATO, which he calls democratic, and the block of the autocrats like Russia and China. These are the two blocks in his mind. It's not the two blocks that I have. The two blocks I would have are between the imperialist block, sometimes divided amongst themselves, but generally operating to crush and curb and control any other uh, um, economic power in the world which stands against the policies of imperialism. And as we can see, Russia has been one of them, and China, of course, is the main enemy. IMF uh, Georgiev pronounced this week that we now live in a more shock-prone world. Yes, the shocks have been coming thick and fast in the 21st century. Georgiev continued, and we need the strength of the collective to deal with the shocks to come. Indeed, we do, but it's not the collective will of the capitalist powers that can deal with these shocks. They've failed on climate change, they failed on preventing and stopping the COVID pandemic, and they failed on ending poverty and keeping world peace. It's gonna depend on the collective will of organized people to do this. Michael, you've had about 20 minutes. And I've finished. You're finished? I've finished. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, you, you've been done very well on timing. Thank you. Uh, I'm, Re really very, very informative introduction to the discussion. It's open to the floor now, comrades. Oh, Matt, you have your hand up. Please come yes. in, Matt. Hi, comrades. Yeah, I thought I might as well make just start on this one. Uh, yeah, thanks to, to, to Michael for that. It's you know it's a new subject, uh, and obviously um, you know one that's gonna we're gonna return to over and over again in in, in the coming period because obviously uh, it's gonna affect everybody. Uh, it's gonna affect uh, living standards um, and the economy throughout the world. Um, uh, you know we're, we're already seeing you know return. Of, you know, the uh, return of huge demonstrations to places like Sudan in the last week, demanding the, the removal of the government, uh, you know, and driven by obviously the, the, the huge price rises in the price of, of grain um, and, and throughout the Middle East. I mean, the thing is that, as I say, you know, it's not it, actually the export of wheat and the lot. Uh, I think Ukraine is the fifth largest exporter in the world and Russia is actually the largest and both have been cut off. Um, by this development, so I mean, essentially, then you know that, that, that the impact of that on a, on a, a wheat importing area, particularly in the Middle East, which actually takes most of these most of the output from both of these countries, is is um, is, is profound. Um, the problem is, for, for, I, I don't agree with Michael's um, statement that, that modern imperialism is mostly an economic mechanism and, and not rather than political. I mean, I think that you know. Uh, what we're really looking at is is the 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 the, the point, point 
the process of this of, of, of disintegration of the of the American imperium um, of the America as hegemon. Uh, in, in, in imperialism, and it, and it is attempting obviously to maintain itself by various mechanisms, you know, um, and 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 of course exacerbating all the way through that, that conflict, you know, uh, across, across a whole series. And, and the fact that this war, of course, is being angled for and aimed at by by and driven by 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 the Ameri by the Americans by by the US. There's no question of that at all. Um, and it, and that um, the you know, I, I think you have to look at, the, you know, obviously the mechanisms of, 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 of current imperialism are, are more, are at least as political as they are economic, because obviously that, that that's the way that they're trying to hold the thing together. Uh, because obviously, you know, under conditions clearly where they can see, I mean, China is now the largest manufacturer in the world. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, obviously um, the, the, the question is, 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 you know, has been openly speculated in the US, is is when does when does the Chinese economy overtake the U.S. economy? Obviously, that, that, that there's a load of other factors to be taken into account, uh, but that's openly the the, the, the point of speculation. Um, the, as you say, also it's about it's it's integration. I mean, the degree of integration is un uh, is, is unprecedented and continues to to be um, incredibly important. I mean, you see that in terms of. Uh, you know, even all, virtual manufacture now is is based across national borders. Um, there isn't any you know significant line of, of production which is not not involved movement of, of of goods of one form or another across national borders. Um, obviously, also finance capital and so on and so forth. And and, and of course, the uh, in, in in terms of once they've managed to to destroy essentially destroy the productive economy in Russia, much of it. Um, in the 90s, of course, it, it meant that Russia became essentially a, a, a producer of, of um, primary goods, um, oil, gas, um, metals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's still heavily, all of that is still heavily integrated into the into the economy. You know, so we see this you know, huge increase in the price of nickel, uh, copper, uh, platinum, as you say, oil. I mean. You know, they, they 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 simply can't section up the world in these in these ways. I mean, this is the problem they've got. Is they've tried it in terms of some, you know, obviously you get to some countries, um, you know, that the, they managed to cut off, you know, Iran to 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 a large degree. They managed to cut off Venezuela to a large degree, and then of course now they're looking at, at Russia, which is either I think the second or third largest producer of oil, one depending on the year, um, and they, and they can't do it. So they're actually back to talking to Venezuela. You know, can you give us some oil? And 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 and, and obviously Boris is, is running around the Middle East and begging all sorts of autocrats, of course, who you know the British have no issue with in terms of their behaviour and so on, uh, for some oil as well. Um, yeah, you know, but Please, can you finish your remarks fairly soon? There's three other people with their hands up, and you're okay. talking for five minutes. All right, all right. Sorry. Yeah. No, I just say that it shows you, you know, the the degree of issue they've got, and the fact this is going to be this is a very this is going to be profound, and it's going to have a huge impact. Um, you know, in terms of um, you know a huge increase in 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 price of of of, of various things. Uh, and a huge dislocation as well. Um, you know, you've already got in this in this country. You know, essentially a position where uh, in, in the sector I work in, in energy, um, you, you know, we're 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 in a state of, of almost of collapse, very close to it, very close. Uh, you know, energy suppliers are now are now walking away. They're either collapsing or walking away. Um, you've also got a position in which. Um, you know, the price of gas now uh, the other week rose to the point which was described to me as being notional. I.e., there is gas and you can buy it, but nobody can afford the stuff. You know, um, and, and, and uh, under those conditions, it, it, it becomes to the point where, where you can't continue to run that system. Um, and that, that it's, it's really quite, becomes quite fundamental. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. OK, thank you, Matt. I'm going to bring in Leslie now, um, Leslie Mahmood. And then we'll go to Finn. Leslie, are you with us? Yeah, I hope you can hear me okay. I seem loud, to be having... Loud and clear, loud and clear. Okay, that's good. I seem to be having a few problems with my connections. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Michael. Um, obviously, the war is going to have a tremendous impact, um, certainly as far as the UK is concerned. 
and obviously many economies things weren't great beforehand and it's quite interesting you you may or may not be familiar with a guy called Martin Lewis who does a lot on um you know sort of consumer uh stuff and he he was saying the narrative is being prepared by the government that's you know it's all to blame on um, on Ukraine and you know that that isn't the case obviously gas and uh oil had already started to to rise on those attacks on living standards um and we've also seen at pno you know a fire in uh, people is just one example um that pno had the money to pay the shareholders the bonuses but have sacked 800 workers uh over the internet basically um and obviously there's protests going on over that but in you know, I'm just wondering, is the picture a bit more complicated? Because obviously at the moment in the UK, the Johnson government, Johnson personally, the, the attacks by other Tory MPs on Johnson have temporarily halted uh, the rumblings against him and the um, his ratings and the Tory ratings have gone up. That's partly because the abysmal position of the um, of, of the Labour Party under Starmer. Um, but we've had 10 years of austerity. We've had sporadic battles, but we've had the counter revolution, so to speak, in the Labour Party. So, you know, it's been quite patchy, the response to getting living standards hammered here. Now, obviously, there has been other movements internationally. So I, I, I'm just asking the question, really. Um, you know, suppose it's a law of combined and uneven development, it, it, you know, that it's not all going to be a uh, revolt just because living standards are, are hammered. Thanks. Thank you, Leslie. Um, next speaker is Finn. Um, comrades, uh, I want to thank uh, Michael for a very informative, interesting opening contribution. I would like to see these figures sort of like study them in some depth, because these figures are very useful in convincing people with our position and the position of Marxism in general and our approach to wars and conflicts on a world scale. But I want to add some additional points. Uh, I read recently that there's a, a gas storage facility about 100 kilometers from Hamburg, which is about the size of 900 soccer pitches, the biggest uh, such uh, storage facility in Europe. And that's now almost empty because Germany gets, as you referred to, about half its um, gas from Russia and Schultz, they shut down the um, development of the Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline, or the Nord Stream 1 has functioned for many, many years. But the, this facility could have provided the gas needs for 2 million households for a year. And it's almost empty. Uh, another thing is the London, I understand, maybe Michael could develop this point, but that London Metal Exchange has ceased trading in lithium. Uh, for a period anyway, and what kind of, what kind of implications uh, does that have? Uh, I was also pleased that you raised the question of uh, the poor, and in particular Africa, and countries such as Egypt. There's 44 million people in, uh, living in famine conditions at the present time, 44 million, and possibly another 200 million or more on the verge of famine. And in Africa, half the um, stable goods they rely on are traded with Russia, <laughs> And uh, the restriction on trade is going to have a detrimental, a devastating effect on the population of Africa. And the World Food Programme gets half its wheat for humanitarian crisis from the Ukraine. So there's a huge implications for the financial crisis. But anyway, there's one industry that's doing very well, as you'd expect, which is the arms industry. There's a uh, Rhein Metall arms producer in, uh, in Germany. The share price has gone up 51% since the pre-war period. The sales are an all-time high. Uh, Schultz has recently launched a uh, hundred uh, million euro um, fund to stimulate the arms production industry in Germany, which is very high already. Germany is the fifth uh, largest arms producer. Uh, France, by the way, is, the, um, is producing, um, it's, it's, I think it might be the third producer in the world. And it produces, uh, makes enormous profits and incidentally, the, the drones that are now being used by Russia to uh, surveil and to destroy facilities in Ukraine, a lot of the facilities, the cameras, the equipment, the GPS equipment and so on, are supplied by German companies. Uh, Germany and France each have supplied 
uh, over 100 million worth of arms to Russia. So there, um, the arms industry doesn't care who buys uh, the weaponry. Uh, America has a huge um, shopping list all over the world. Their exports have gone up enormously in the last four years. They're the biggest uh, exporter of arms uh, across the world. And the shopping list uh, is worth looking at as well. I mean, the F-35 stealth bombers, which Lockheed Martin produced in America, they cost 100 million each. So shooting one of these things down, enormous loss to humanity. And we need to look at this, what the arms industry is doing. Maybe Michael might deal with the implications of that, the growth in the arms industry and the profits that have been made by these companies. The Franco-German Airbus produces a tornado surveillance aircraft. And um, a lot of that stuff has been sold and is being sold to countries that are supposed to be in, in conflict. There's a question I'd like Michael to deal with possibly a bit more is this issue of, of China. Uh, China is trying to, because it's a growing and developing economy, it needs stability to develop its position in the world. Whereas Russia, which is in a chaotic state and is a declining economy, would have a slightly different approach. But China has very little trade with Russia compared to the rest of the world. And it's got not a lot of interest in this conflict and it would rather it wasn't happening. Now there was a talk, there were talks a few days ago between Biden and Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader. And, uh, uh, um, China and America have something in common there. America's main interest at the moment is the Indo-Pacific region. They're not that pushed either about Europe, but they're drawn into the conflict, obviously because of the implications of NATO and the world imperialist powers, but they would rather be focusing on the Pacific uh, region, I think. And China certainly doesn't want to get embroiled uh, in the conflict. And again, what do you think is likely to happen there? China is looking for a way to keep, a way, to keep out of the conflict. I mean, they don't recognize the Crimea, incidentally, has been a part of Russia, and they abstained in the vote in the UN. Now, that's not hugely significant in itself, the UN vote, but it does indicate the kind of thinking of the Chinese. And just in conclusion, uh, Michael, just when you listed the, I think it was four headings at the beginning about how the West presents this conflict as being a heroic uh, Ukraine fighting for democracy and world freedom, uh, and that NATO stands for you know, freedom and democracy across the world. When you presented that, I mean, that's very convincing and very, very accurate. But nonetheless, there's a subtlety we need to bear in mind as well. I mean, Ukraine has a right to self-determination and has a right to fight to expel the Russian invaders. We should stand for the right of self-determination of Ukraine and for the withdrawal of uh, Russian troops and uh, the end of the Russian attack on uh, Ukraine. So even though the point you make are correct, and I agree with them completely, that we wouldn't want to be interpreted, we wouldn't want these to be interpreted in any way by anybody as saying, well, we don't really attach a lot of importance to the struggle of the Ukrainian people. And it's more and more the Ukrainian people now, in addition, uh, along with the army, fighting against the Russian invasion. So the Russian, the Ukrainian right to self-determination needs to be emphasized and the call for Russian withdrawal uh, from, um, from Ukraine similarly, but thank you again for a very informative and very interesting contribution. Thank you, Finn. Um, next speaker is David, David Henson. Um, yeah, let me join in the chorus there, uh, Michael. That was uh, a marvelous presentation. I just hope we didn't rush you too quickly <laughs> through the slide. I was looking for um, a full development of the analysis of uh, imperialism, in particular, the emphasis on uh, high tech and the economic component um, of imperialism, because I think this really is worthy of, of looking at right now, because this war was entirely unpredicted. I, I, it's, it's been a surprise to, to everybody, including us. I don't think any of us saw uh, Russia in particularly an adventurous imperialist mood, and yet it's it 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 uh, you know Putin announced what he was going to do. He put all the steps in order. He said he was never going to do it, and then he did it. That's classical imperialist tactics. But I I think that the emphasis on the economic is is really important, and I just want to bring out you know some points in relation, particularly to can we say intra internal imperialist strategy, because imperialism, I agree with you, it's in the fundamentals, it's about the acquisition of assets and the extension of markets. And I think this is a critical point which relates particularly to Ukraine, 
because the EU operates as a certain pole of attraction as a market. Uh, as uh, I think your stats show and other stats have shown, Ukraine has been in a kind of doldrums, you know, for a period. Uh, it had, you know, been producing these agricultural marvels, which, which are noted, but that didn't really translate into higher living standards for those in, in, in Ukraine uh, to any great extent. Although I'm very impressed with the education system, at least in this way, I mean, it's extraordinary that so many very ordinary people can speak English at a very high level. Uh, it's astonishing, actually. Uh, if you would go anywhere else in the world, I don't think you'd see anything quite like that, that, that at all. Maybe that's another side of the cultural side of imperialism. And when does a dominant order, people fit in with it, uh, you know, as, as we do in the colonial world. But I just want to raise this question, particularly um, returning a little to the gas uh, question, um, and to the tra entrapment of Russia, and why I think to some extent Putin felt he had to make a desperate measure. Um, and that is because Russia seems to be uh, trapped in a kind of fossil fuel economy. Uh, every, uh, Germany pre uh, made a prediction, I mean, as part of their economic plan, and apparently they haven't changed it, that in eight years they'll be dropping uh, the fossil fuel uh, component of their economy to close to zero. Now, that, that, that is a complete reversal. That came from the Social Democrats and the Greens. It didn't come from Merkel's wing at all. Merkel had another strategy, which was to incorporate Russia into the German economy and to gradually incorporate it so deeply that it wouldn't want to resist becoming part of the economic market, if not of the direct EU, but of the economic market uh, of, of the EU. Um, and uh, you know, I just want to raise the strategy. That strategy has now collapsed completely. A strategy of, of uh, I was going to use an Afrikaans word, tunothering. It means getting close to and, and, and getting in bed with, uh, with between Germany and Russia, uh, which was a, a very powerful impulse you know, in, a, in a way, because I, the deal might be that uh, Germany would help uh, Russia develop in, in, in a sense with a, a manufacturing base, which, which uh, well, I'm just speculating, but in other words, to make some sort of break from the fossil fuel uh, syndrome in, in which they're in. It's marvelous to have these high levels of gas and oil exports, but what are you going to do with it when the prices go rock high and then no one wants to buy it because now you have to accelerate uh, you know, renewables? And I'm going to raise this question with you. Are we going to see a return to uh, you know, to, to button down uh, on fossil fuels, or will we see a fairly rapid uh, transition to renewables around the world? I mean, there's a lot of talk about this, but what, what's the most likely uh, uh, development? In South Africa, we have un, uh, unspeakable resources in terms of sunlight. Uh, we, have, we could, we could uh, power uh, the entire country, uh, you know, from a couple of square miles, you know, of... Uh, solar panels in, 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 in the Northern Cape, which is the most remarkably uncloudy weather in the world, but it's not done. It's not done at all because there are powerful interests in the coal industry, and so they're totally opposed to it. And uh, the radical wing, so-called, of, of the ANC is totally opposed to it. Anyway, I want, to look, I want to ask that. Are we in a position internationally where we will see a turn away from fossil fuels it is not moving ahead quite in the uh, anticipated basis on which um, the, you know, they were working. In other words, that there was a fall in, in fossil fuel. We've seen an acceleration in, in the past period. Uh, you know, will there be a break in the, in the world economic order you know, on that uh, question? The last point I want to just touch on, I, I don't think I have the time to develop it, but let me raise it, um, is that you've mentioned that the global South uh, you know, the impoverished countries of, of the global south are going to take the, uh, the hit, you know, most deeply. In South Africa, we've had the most extraordinary development where the resource sector has gone through the roof. Uh, I think there's been, uh, until the last few days, uh, the stock exchange show resource sector shows an increase of about 40%. This is an, an economy which is entirely depleted and totally mismanaged uh, by the state sector and by the private sector as well. Uh, and with 12 million and growing unemployment. And yet now the resources are going through the roof and it's going to give some temporary advantage. But I think the other side of it will be an enormous acceleration inequality. 
if price, if, if the stem, uh, you know, stock exchange goes through the roof, at least in one sector, that doesn't mean at all there'll be any redistribution to, you know, to the most impoverished sectors. And we, I think we're going to see a rapid increase in impoverishment in Africa and probably in, in, in Latin America as well. The contradiction is that nearly all these countries are totally pro-Putin. Uh, in South Africa, there's a very powerful pro-Putin movement seeing that the enemy of my enemy is my friend and that hoping that somehow out of all of this mess, you know, there will be a, a advantage to, to poor people in, in, in Africa, which is far from the case. And I do like the point that you made that we're not seeing, we, we don't see, you know, imperialism as, as forming two blocks, although there might be tactical, you know, positioning of that side. We see that the fundamental process, the driving processes of the relentless and remorseless accumulation of capital and the falling rate of profit, which drives capital even further to explore and to, and to exploit. And in the experience of Africa, China has been quite as, a, as exploitative, in fact, even more rigorously anti-union than even uh, uh, Western uh, you know, corporates in, in the mining sector and elsewhere, quite determined to build up uh, local dictatorships you know, against the uh, working people. But again, thanks for your points. I, I, I'm so glad to see you've got the uh, slides up there. I'll have a good look at them. And I think we should all do that too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. um, th there is currently no one with their hand up. So this is an opportunity if you were, if you had a little question or you were just thinking of making a small point, maybe making one short short sentence to your contribution to this meeting, this is the opportunity to do it. Susan, please come in. Okay. Uh, my question is not so much the blocks, where although I would agree that they are imperialist versus, um, uh, I don't know that it's autocratic, but certainly state organized. It's the fly in the ointment is the trillionaires, for want of a better word, the people who are individuals who control uh, finances that are the size of medium countries GDP. You know, the Bezos and the Gates and the rest of the people and the extent to which the COVID pandemic has revealed how vast fortunes can be made corruptly from holding the rest of the world to ransom. We have not shared the vaccines. We have not, um, we have allowed the global South to be deprived of the medicines while we have basically hogged them. And I just look at it and go, this is a war of the 1% against the 99% of the rest of the world. And they are using military might and his, you know, media hysteria to institute more regime change and to try and vie for more control of the world's future resources. Because eventually, because of pushback over climate change. So okay. it's not so much a question, but it's a comment that actually there is more than I, I liked your presentation it was very good but I do wonder as to how many individuals have fermented this situation. Great thank you very much Susan um, uh, valuable contribution and an example that you know if you just want to say one small point it's worth coming into the discussion stimulates other people's thinking. Anybody else would, would any other comrade like to ask a question make a short point Well, Michael, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come back here. It's not by any means the end of the discussion, but to respond to some of the things that have been said. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, well, as I have circulated the slides, and actually there are quite a few more slides in there than I uh, showed you, rushed through thinking I was running out of time, but I actually have plenty, as Ed pointed out. Um, so I could have developed some of the points that uh, David Hemson has uh, brought up or questions. David, as usual, has got some penetrating questions that are very difficult to answer and to clarify. 
as he knows as well, because we are always trying to uh, gauge what is happening in these uh, different areas. Let me start with an important question, though, is that um, do we regard the Russia as an imperialist country? Uh, somebody mentioned, well, imperialism is just isn't about economics. It's also about politics. I couldn't deny that. That's absolutely correct. But underneath it lies the economic foundations of, uh, of imperialist power. And what are they? Well, they are the productive uh, size of a country, its ability to accumulate capital at the expense of other uh, capitalist uh, economies around the world, its financial power and its military power. If you do an index of those four items, which Tony Norfield did, uh, uh, he calls it the imperialist power index, you can, surprise, surprise, you find there are about seven or eight countries, which basically the G7 economies, as we call them, which is the big European powers, the United States and Japan, Canada, and they are the imperialist powers, and they're way more powerful in all those four factors on the whole than all the other countries, including China, and including in particular Russia, which is a puny economic power relative uh, to the G7 powers. So, and from my view, that distinguishes the imperialist powers on an economic basis and a political and military basis. As uh, Finbar said, that you know, military power is so important now, and that's a big factor in, the, the, in us defining the imperialist powers in the world. And they are the ones that are making decisions uh, uh, that affect 7 billion people are around the world, not the other major powers. They have a limited, a limited effect, perhaps in their region or area, but on the whole, if we're looking at the overall global situation, it's imperialism and the decisions made by the imperialist powers, they don't always agree, as uh, has been mentioned, I'll come to a moment, but, but their aim is to maintain and sustain the position of these imperialist powers globally against the interest not only of the whole working class, but also of all the other countries in the world, so that they don't progress from relative poverty or extreme poverty uh, to uh, reach a level of prosperity for their population uh, as a whole. And of course, even within the imperialist powers, we know, of course, that such as inequality, such as it grown recently of inequality of wealth and income, that uh, the heart sizable section of the population doesn't even have the prospering prosperity that appears on the average data. So in my view, those are the imperialist powers. So that means in my view, Russia is not an imperialist power. Why is it not an imperialist power? It's a weak economic power. As uh, David points out, it's uh, concentrated on fossil fuels and energy and resources. It's a one trick pony. It doesn't have the technology of superiority of the imperialist powers across a range of industries. In addition, although it has military might, it has no financial power, and its military might is weak compared to the NATO powers these days. It has no financial power. Its export of capital is small compared to the imperialist powers. It's not an imperialist power in that sense. What it is, uh, existing the post-Soviet uh, Russia, uh, it's irony to see that I saw that the University of Florida has banned Karl Marx's uh, uh, study group from the uh, University of Florida, Florida because Karl Marx represents Russia. Uh, and a hilarious decision, uh, considering that Karl Marx was dead even before the Soviet Union. And secondly, uh, hilarious from the point of view that Russia hasn't been a Soviet Union for um, over three decades now. And is actually, more importantly, a crony capitalist economy. What do I mean by that? It's not imperialist. It, it's a capitalist economy, dominant, concentrating in a certain area and run by a bunch of what we call oligarchs for the Russians. But as Susan said, basically the 1% is the same people that exist in the West, except apparently in the media likes to call Russian billionaires oligarchs. Uh, it doesn't call British or American or uh, German billionaires oligarchs. They're just billionaires or uh, good working capitalists. But there is a crony feature about Russian capitalism. It's dominated by patronage, by corruption, by state influence and so on. Even more, you'd say that if we look in the papers every day in Britain, we can't see much difference because it's increasingly like that here. But also, uh, but it is different. It's built up a tradition of being built upon the privatization of state assets after the Soviet Union, corruption and control by a small group of people, uh, the bringing into a political power, 
corrupt and autocratic and nasty KGB agents from the past, uh, Putin being that represented is the most efficient one. It is a form of capitalism which is, as far as imperialism is concerned, would be fine. They're quite happy with Saudi Arabia. They're quite happy with Egypt as being vicious autocratic di military dictatorships uh, as Saudi Arabia executes 80 people a day um, uh, in order to maintain its uh, rule there. That apparently is okay because those countries are at work along the interests of imperialism in general. But when a country steps out of line, like uh, Iraq or Syria or Afghanistan, uh, or in this case, much more importantly and threateningly, Russia, uh, then uh, imperialism has a completely different attitude towards uh, uh, that development. So I don't see, I don't think it's correct to say that this war is between two imperialist powers trying to control Ukraine. This is a war that has become about because particularly US imperialism wished to strangle and uh, uh, weaken the ability of Russia to operate and resist uh, US imperialism. Uh, and to do so, it has been expanding the forces of NATO from the across to the borders of Russia. Uh, and in Ukraine, with, you know, Georgia and Moldova have been the more recent developments where it's been trying to do that. And it has been, uh, it has been able to egg on and get the support of a whole layer of, of nationalists within Ukraine. The Ukraine people never been in favor of joining NATO until the last three or four years. And even the, there's only been a majority actually when the Russia threatened uh, the invasion. Uh, so the idea that um, this war is a, between two imperialist powers seems to me incorrect. This is a war egged on by US imperialism in particular in order to strangle Russia. And as, as I think uh, Finbar said and others have said, first Russia and next China, because these countries have to be dealt with if US imperialism in particular is to maintain its hegemonic status. As I think uh, David suggested, Germany hasn't followed that policy up to now. The European imperialists have seen, sought to, as it were, engage um, uh, Russia in a trade and financial agreement and not to uh, control it and weaken it as the US have done. So there's been a div division of opinion there, but that's now united because Putin has reacted uh, in the way that he's done in order to try and preserve the position of Russian crony capitalism. And of course, I agree entirely with what uh, Finbar said, we have to condemn this invasion by Russia outright. This is an absolute disaster and a tragic uh, and cruel uh, measure being taken by a bunch of oligarchs and their representatives in Russia to preserve their interests and their influence over their border countries around the former Soviet Union. And the six million, apart from all the deaths, six million people, uh, and nine million people displaced from their homes, the complete destruction of cities. Is that any way that we could support such a disgusting and grotesque uh, uh, invasion? On the other hand, this has come about precisely because of the role of US imperialism on the one hand and Putin's cronyism on the other, and Ukraine is the victim in the middle here and, the, and its people that are involved. And that, so we, we should obviously support Ukrainian self-determination, but it's not as always as simple as that because the right of self-determination of Ukraine, does that mean that the Zelensky government and its uh, semi-fascist supporters in there will therefore want to crush the Eastern uh, Ukrainian Russian speaking element of their provinces. It's not going to be a simple question of just saying, well, that's fine for the Zelensky government. It seems to me as socialists, we should oppose the Zelensky government as well and all its policies that it's represented in uh, helping to develop this particular crisis and the disaster that's going to be, that has happened. I just have that, I agree with Mahmoud uh, that, um, the huge increase in food and energy prices started before this war. That already capitalism was finding it difficult to sustain uh, decent growth with prices under control. The COVID pandemic slump had caused a supply chain disruption, uh, a collapse of supply in general, a sharp increase in food and energy prices anyway. And that has been fed through by 
different governments, but in the case of the UK government, they've made no attempt to help out ordinary people to deal with these energy price increases and food price increases. And as Martin Lewis said, uh, in, uh, the great consumer guru for uh, these sorts of things, that th these price rises that we're now going to hit, with energy prices in the UK to double by October, uh, double. I mean, it's bad enough that it is for poor households to meet uh, fuel and food prices. We're going to see a doubling in food prices, uh, fuel, fuel prices uh, in the next six months. And who knows what happens after that? And that's before the impact of the Ukraine-Russia uh, war, which, of course, is going to dramatically increase uh, uh, prices. Uh, so, as I said, the disposable income on average for the average British household is going to fall by the biggest fall in one year since 1956. And that's just the UK. That gives you an indication of what can be happening in many other countries around the world. David raised the point, I, I'm not sure if I know the answer. Is Does this situation mean that fuel prices are going to, uh, the fuel fossil fuel industry is going to expand or will it actually the fossil fuel uh, industry? I think, I think probably he answered almost, I don't agree with him himself, he said, there's a tremendous vested interest in sustaining the fossil fuel industry, not only the coal people, but the oil and gas people. And I think we're going to see uh, the argument presented that we have no alternative but to increase the supplies of this fossil fuel uh, sector because the Russian, uh, we must boycott the Russian sector and we have to replace it with new sources of uh, fuel energy. And therefore, we'll be, I think coal already has been expanding significantly in production. And we're going to see that elsewhere. So on the one hand, we're going to have desire, the imperialist desire to sustain the fossil fuel industry in order to punish Russia. And on the other hand, you'd have to say that the high prices that we're going to get make the case for renewables so much greater now than they ever were before. And we have the technology to change this. We can move away from fossil fuel in, uh, industry and move towards uh, uh, fuels that meet the energy that people need without carbon emissions. The answer, I'm afraid, is while the fossil fuel industry remains in private hands, in the hands of the oligarchies and the oligopolies everywhere, we cannot expect an improvement in the situation. Up to even before this, climate change policy was failing. The targets were not going to be met. Fossil fuel industry was not going to be reduced sufficiently uh, to meet even the Paris targets. We're going to get the world is warming up to the point of devastation over the next few decades. I think that this war only adds to the risks that we're going to be even worse off with the global warming over the next two decades. Thank you, Michael. Um, the, uh, there was, I, I think we, we got what you were saying. There was a very slight interruption in your transmission for, for a, a half, half a second at some point, but I think, I think we, we all got what you were saying. Um, thank you. Um, it's over to Maddie. Maddie Gray, you've had your hand up for a while now, so please come in. Oh, thanks. Um, I've got a couple of questions and I'm sort of thinking a little. Um, one of the things that struck me about the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan and the whole of NATO, whatever, but the withdrawal from Afghanistan is what will the um, military industrial com uh, complex do to make sure that they can still sell weapons? This is a general question. If Michael can answer it or someone else, I'd be very happy. But when I see the amount of um, stuff being sent to the Ukraine, I think, yeah, this is where the military industrial complex is making its um, profits today. That's one point. The other question is whether it's possible to replace some of the important things that the Ukraine has been using by products from other places, like for instance, South Africa, which has apparently this year's wheat supply, wheat, um, farmers, the winter, summer wheat and wheat farmers have had a bumper crop. They can surely find 
export markets. Um, same with um, sunflower and sunflower oil. When it comes to the um, all the precious metals, which is in such short supply, South Africa is one of the countries that is blessed with an amazing amount of um, metals. And many of them are these very important metals, which are um, which high tech uses and spaceships use. Not that I think that I'm crazy about you, um, more mining in South Africa, but it is would be a possibility, and if properly handled, particularly if one follows David's idea of building more solar panels, South Africa might be able to step up and replace some of it before the prices go off the wall. Anyway, um, two questions about how realistic these things are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maddie. Very, very good questions. Um, I hope uh, other comrades will um, come in with questions like that as well, or, or endeavour to answer questions. It doesn't just have to be Michael who, who will be answering these questions. Next speaker I'm going to call into the discussion is, is that Dominic who's asking to come in? John. John, OK, please come in, John. Yeah, it's a very small point, but it was a news item I saw yesterday on the BBC. And this was an interview with the librarian of the main library in Odessa. And the interview was asking her what, how it was going with the library, you know, because I believe it's a fairly prestigious library. And she said, well, we've banished all the Russian uh, publications and all the Russian authors to the top shelf where nobody can find them you know, Dostoevsky and all the others. And it was just that sort of Ukrainian nationalism that, if you like, came out in the Maidan uh, incident in 2014, where I think for a brief period, there was actually a move to ban the Russian language in Ukraine. So I don't think whatever the outcome of the war is, that there's going to be real tensions there because a lot of Ukrainians, Russian is their first language. There's a whole integration of Russia and Ukraine. And one of the things I cannot understand for the life of me, how it is that Putin and the Russian army are bombarding Russian speaking cities, you know, and not just military installations, but residential areas, which can only, in my opinion, alienate people in those areas from Russia. But on the other hand, I think a comrade a few weeks ago when we had a discussion on the Ukraine talked about the fact that I think in, in the East, there was a brigade that had quite definite fascist links with it and, you know, seemed to be getting up the noses of the local Russian speaking population, a bit like the British Army having the parachute regiment in very sensitive areas in Northern Ireland. It's just that observation, because I think Putin's strategy, the Russian Army's strategy, has been absolutely, you know, words can't describe it, the stupidity and incompetence of the way the Russians tackled this invasion they never went for if you like strategic bridges to ensure that they're we seem to have a break in dominic's transmission here uh, we'll just give you a minute said that this lorry was bogged down because its tires had gone flat and the reporter said well it looks as though the cheap imports from China, you know, it was just the, if you like, the whole incompetence of the war and the way 
if you like, that um, the Ukrainian leadership was egged on by NATO to get into a fight and then to be left high and dry once he got into that fight. It's just observations, not, if you like, uh, you know, things. But it, it really, I just feel that whatever the outcome and whatever peace deal might be reached between Zelensky and Putin, that there's going to be a lot more going on after this uh, war in terms of insurgencies on both sides. And anyway, I'll leave it at that, comrades. Thank you. Um, we, we, we lost a little, a little bit of what you said on a break in transmission, but I think comrades got the gist of it. It was about half a sentence. Um, okay. Um, are, are there any other comrades who want to come into the meeting? Um, even if it's just a short point. Yeah, Paul, you have your hand up. Please come in. Yeah, just a short but perhaps fun, important question. With the war in Ukraine at the moment, have the Ukrainian farmers been able to do any planting of the wheat, which is uh, which is a big, a huge source of uh, the world's supply of wheat? Yeah, good question. Good question. Um, anyone who, anyone else? I mean, th these are examples of, of very good questions that you know, comrades. Don't please don't feel you have to make a lengthy contribution to to you know have a, have a say in this discussion. Um, anyone who has not spoken want to come in and say anything? Okay, I'm going to call David for a second. Um, go. So try and keep your remarks reasonably brief. That oh, hang on, hang on, David. Before you go, we've got uh, we've we've got Jonathan Bellos who's not spoken yet. So I'm going to ask him to come in before you. Jonathan, please come in. Uh, yes, it's only a very small point. Um, because we are reliant entirely on Western media, we don't really know how uh, accurately they're portraying what's going on there we can only take the film that they are showing us so um i'm not trying to support putin at all it looks absolutely terrible what he's doing but it's quite possible that he is planning to have a limited um invasion in order to put in donetsk and luhansk uh regions um it's possible but i it looks like he's planning a complete i don't i really don't know from the way the western media are portraying it he it looks as if putin is planning a, an invasion of the whole country but i i feel that maybe he's not uh planned to do that because there isn't much to be gained by having the whole country so um i don't know i really don't know that's that's all i can say I must say, Jonathan, I agree with you that it's terribly difficult to get sources of information that really clarify what's going on. You, everything that the Western media says, one one has to take with a strong pinch of salt as well. Um, so, you know, I, I welcome the the different views that comrades are giving. Um, David, please come into the discussion now. Well, well, just um, so you know, some short points. Just on the question of um, of the press, you know, the BBC has been trying to uh, to get embedded with the Russians, <laughs> uh, but they absolutely refuse. So there's no possibility of any independent reporting from the Russian side. So it's um, you know, you know, that was utopian idea probably in the first place. The issue then really is, um, you know, how do we sift uh, fact from uh, fiction? And it's hard to know exactly, except unless you've had experience of war to see people in the front line and if those are genuine shells, you know, falling around them and, 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 and so forth. But it, you know, the basic question is not so much the immediate reporting. Uh, if you remember the original Crimean war was lost in a sense by the, uh, the Times correspondence giving a whole critique of what was taking place on the British side and telling the truth. 
So capitalism and imperialism does need chunks of the truth because they need to know what's going on. I, I don't think their security services are particularly good. And actually, uh, you know, anyway, look, it's an open debate about how to sift through, you know, the evidence of your eyes and uh, the way in which they prioritize something or other. The main thing they seem to be prioritizing now is the amount of refugees and the destruction of the cities. I mean, those, that seems to be something that's incontestable. The, the number of bodies, no one will ever know. Uh, the number of uh, tanks and actually on the ground, I mean, we, we, we just don't know. Uh, the crisis in the Russian military, uh, you know, the fact that they've not been able to advance further, uh, you know, there, there, there are all 101, you know, different uh, theories about that. My question was really going to be a little more on the economic uh, for Michael. I, I know I'm, I'm, throw, I'm just throwing questions, but let's just think about this. Um, you know, if we're looking at, um, you know, decisive action, which is, uh, you know, political, arising from concentrated economics, you know, did, was there any evidence of the concentrated economics on the Russian side, you know, forcing or, or propelling forward, um, you know, Putin to, 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 to make such a decision? Was it an arbitrary decision? Well, look, I'm, I'm, you know, in the last and last week, we, we find it hard to do that. Personally, I feel that the, the point that we've made a few times is that a, the huge political struggle in Belarus and then the explosion in Kazakhstan put um, Putin in a very jumpy position where he, he could see something like that happening. And so he had to prepare internally first and then externally with the military, you know, to, to intervene. The fact that it's turned into something less than than perfection, you know, is 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 another political factor. But really, it's I suppose it's how does a a weak capitalist state or a, a capitalist state which has uneven development, um, in other words, a, a relatively restricted base, but a fairly well developed um, military sector. I'm, I'm not comparative to the EU, but having had experience of of uh, Success in inverted commas by mass bombings in uh, you know in Chechnya and in, in the past and in Syria and then in elsewhere where they've won hands down you know with uh, with overwhelming force. Uh, the fact that it's not worked out this time is, is 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 something of a miscalculation. It's a miscalculation, I think, on both sides of 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 the divide. I think it's a miscalculation by Putin, but it's also a miscalculation, and it was a surprise, I think. You know, to the CIA and so forth. They never expected Putin to jump quite, you know, quite as, uh, sh as sharply as he did. And the question is, you know, is there evidence of, of concentrated economics at play here, or the struggle for markets? Personally, I don't see how Russia can expand markets. In the uh, let's say that he carries out his original vision of 2007 was to reconstruct the entire USSR under under Russia. Um, now, I, I, that he has that imperial design, uh, but you know, is is it is it is it any way is it feasible that uh, Russia could create markets around itself to become an economic pole of attraction? Um, but maybe there's a simple answer to that, Michael. I, I just leave it with you. Mm. Okay, thank you, David. Um, I'm going to call Jonathan in again. Jonathan didn't speak for very long last time, so please come in, Jonathan. Yeah, um, this is another thing. It's in entirely subjective from my point of view. I think that what um, prompted um, Russia to go into this war was that the Americans were upping uh, the amount of weapons into Ukraine quite a lot because they feared that the Russian Nord Stream gas pipeline was going to come on stream because there was a considerable increase in um, activity in the Donbass region they, the, um, the on the Ukrainian side to try and uh, pummel that lot. And I think that the, the idea was to create as much trouble as possible to, to um, influence German public opinion against uh, agreeing the pipeline after all it had already been built. Um, and I think that that was what prompted Putin to go completely berserk. He thought, well, if I'm not going to get the pipeline, it's not, it, it, I've got nothing to lose. Um, he, he, he'd already um, was 
barred from most trade with the West. So he he was he was in a corner, and um, uh, that's that's why he reacted the way he did because obviously they've been piling the pressure on the Donbass region for such a long time, eight years, and um, he had also uh, invested a huge amount of money in connecting cri the Crimean. Um, um, peninsula with Russia across the Azov Sea. He built a bridge that's 19 kilometers long, a rail and road bridge. Um, he'd really invested in, in, in this area and he could see all that falling apart. So he thought, well, uh, I might as well go for broke. And it's a terrible thing to say, but that's how he thinks. He doesn't care that much about people. He, he's an autocrat um and he just thought if i don't go for go for it now when the west is really weak what with the pandemic and and um all kinds of other things uh i'll never go for it so he, he took an attitude which is utterly inhuman and shocking um and invaded that that's the way i see it well, thank you thank you jonathan um would any other comrade like to come in Um, just give it a minute for anyone to think. Otherwise, otherwise if, if nobody else wants to come in, I'm going to ask Michael to come back. And um, we're getting towards half past five, Michael. So th this this could be your um, sort of final summing up, um, unless what you say gives rise to a lot more of contro controversy and questions. So over to you, Michael. Well, thanks, Ed. Um... Again, some very good questions. I'm not sure I can answer them all. Um, what is what was the economic uh, basis for Russia's invasion from the Russian point of view? A uh, bit of a debate there. Uh, I, I think I think yeah, I would say that uh, uh, John and David have made points which are relevant to that. That Russia saw it's it's a in my view is an economy that's a one trick pony based on fossil fuel and minerals. It doesn't really, it's an uneven development. It's a narrow economic base with a big military force left over from the past of the Cold War. Uh, Putin is a nationalist who believes that um, his job is to build Russian uh, influence in the region that used to be of the Soviet Union, that uh, Russia has uh, should be a world power, at least a regional power. And yet here he was with uh, fossil fuel industry, which is under threat on the long term, uh, where he's facing uh, in encroachment along the borders of the Soviet Union, ex-Soviet Union, of NATO powers, of uh, in particular, a crucial one, Ukraine, which has always been seen by Putin and the Russian nationalists as basically part of Russia or connected closely to Russia, despite and the languages are not far apart. A, a sizable minority of Ukrainians only speak Russian or it's their predominant language. Uh, he saw that is within this economic sphere of influence uh, for Russian capitalism and his fellow oligarchs. Um, Ukraine has its own oligarchs who are basically Russian oligarchs as well. And Ukraine for years was run by and controlled after the fall of the Soviet Union by a, a series of oligarchs and, and leaders who swung between looking to the West, to the EU, uh, for uh, Ukraine's prosperity or looking to Russia uh, for continued support. Uh, and that division existed within the Ukrainian elite uh, for decades and eventually erupted, as we know, in the... Uh, Maiden uh, coups of revolution of 2014, we got a straight division between a section of the population who, who turned towards Russia and a section of the population who looked to the West for the EU. The majority of Ukrainians weren't in favor of NATO, but they were keen on joining the EU because they thought that would give them economic prosperity that Ukraine badly lacked. Uh, Ukraine has been the poorest growth country in the whole or fifth poorest in the world and the poorest in Europe. It's hardly recovered from this collapse of the Soviet Union. Russia's done better in Ukraine. It's been a disaster, uh, Ukraine economically. And that has led to this uh, terrible situation in Ukraine, which divided 
not only the elite in Ukraine about which way to go, but also uh, population increasingly. And imperialism, particularly US imperialism, egged that nationalist view on against the Russians. So the Russians under Putin, their action is, as they see it, to preserve their economic interests and the influence that Russia's got over Ukraine and some of the other border states like Georgia, Moldova, and so on, which had all, they'd lost control of the, the Baltic states and others. They'd been basically lost control of their influence in the Balkans as well during the Balkan Wars um, in the 1990s, where NATO uh, crushed the position of Serbia, the main supporter uh, and follower of, the Soviet, of Russia and Putin's Russia. So this, as far as Putin concedes, if he was to concede Ukraine to the, the West, this would be the last straw as he saw it. Uh, the idea that he could actually got, in my view, there was a, another way out, which of course has nothing to do with uh, the position of Putin's nationalism and the position of the Putin elite or the Ukrainian elite, but of course that option of uh, working class governments uh, having a position and a role in Ukraine and in Russia does not exist at the moment. So if you could say that Russia was or Putin felt he was forced into this war because he had no alternative. Of course, the war that he's conducted, and as has been described by comrades, has been a complete and utter mess and a disaster, a grotesque and barbarous approach to the whole thing. I think they probably thought they could do it strategically, taking strategic bases and walking to the cities of Ukraine without opposition. But they faced such uh, a reasonably good opposition from the Ukrainian military. By the way, the Ukrainian military generals uh, worked in cadet schools with the Russian military general. They're all exactly the same bunch, of the same age, and they all know each other, and they all know each other's tactics. So the, uh, what was involved was extra weaponry that came from the West, which enabled the Ukrainian military since 2014 uh, to build up a base of resistance. So the Russians unable to do it in the way they thought they were going to do it, because of their own incompetence and because of the resistance of the Ukrainians. So they've resorted to what any power uh, would do in that situation, which is just blitzkrieg cities now, in order to try and drive the population into submission or drive them out. Where is this going? Uh, Dominic says, this is not going to be the end of it if Russia manages to establish political control of the country, or at least surround the cities and force uh, the Ukrainian regime into a deal of some sort. What could a deal that be? In my view, that deal would probably be what they could have got without a war uh, originally, uh, if uh, they hadn't been egged on on one side and the nationalist approach of the Putin on the other. Probably a deal which says, and Zelensky's sort of offered that, that Ukraine will not join NATO, it will be neutral, uh, but and that the provinces of eastern Ukraine will have a certain autonomy, they will remain part of Ukraine. This was the old uh, Minsk Accords, which existed in 2014-2015. That's what Putin will probably settle for now, rather than uh, have to continue the war. He hasn't got that. And the reason he hasn't got that is that Zelensky and the Ukrainian government is not prepared to offer that. They still fancy their chances against the Russians and Western support. And what they would be, while they would accept neutrality, what they want is international agreement of neutrality and the allowance of the Ukrainians to militarize themselves, even though they're neutral from NATO. So as far as Putin's concerned, if the Ukrainian military is gonna be built up by the Americans, but it just doesn't happen to be in NATO, and Ukraine joins the EU, then that's a de facto uh, defeat for Putin. So they still haven't got the basis of an agreement here yet. So that's why Putin continues with this barbarous blitzkrieg in order to force the Ukrainians to accept a deal which is closer that he can find face. But as Dominic says, does that mean they're gonna sit in there and be attacked by guerrilla movements and military incursions by the Ukrainians indefinitely? And the Russians are gonna respond by bombing the cities again? Uh, this is such a mess. Uh, Putin's gonna have to get out of Ukraine in the end. Uh, the question is on what terms and, that, and whether he will survive uh, long enough to uh, achieve that remains to be seen. I don't think we, we know the answer to that question yet. Uh, have the Ukrainians' uh, economy so destroyed they haven't um, sown the wheat for this year? Well, 
apart from the western part of Ukraine, near Lvov, uh, around that area, which is still relatively free of conflict, the main areas of the, of the granaries of Ukraine are not being seeded. They're not being prepared for the autumn wheat because of the conflict. This is a disaster. Um, and this is the prospect of even higher food prices and the, and the weakness of the Ukrainian economy. Could uh, other countries replace the loss of grain exports in Russia and Ukraine? Well, the answer is no, not in the short term anyway. And not probably at all, because these are major exporters of major grain. Uh, South Africa may increase its production. Parts of Latin America may increase its production. But the big granary areas are actually the US and Canada, which are at maximum levels already. So I think it's very unlikely that uh, wheat and grain supplies can be restored unless this conflict ends very soon. So to, to summarize my view is that this war is the result of, on the one hand, imperialism desiring to surround, engage, and control Russian influence. And on the other hand, Russian, uh, Russia's under Putin and the oligarchs desert, trying to maintain their economic interests as they see it and the control of their elite that they've got under the threat of imperialism. Ukraine has tremendous resources. I think I wrote in a post, I don't know, my very first post, which pointed out the IMF had a very interesting report about the fact that so far Ukraine's grain and wheat exports are very low productivity. Their productivity level in Ukraine is very low. Why? Because 75% of Ukraine production comes from small proprietors on small bits of land in Ukraine. And the multinational or larger commercial operations are relatively small in their production. They're the more productive elements but small uh, proprietors are the ones that exist in Ukraine. And the policy of both the Ukrainian government and the IMF is to privatize the land. They're gonna take it out of the hands of the small pro proprietors and sell it off to big commercial corporations, including foreign ones. This is a major program supported by the World Bank and the IMF in order to transform and turn Ukrainian agriculture into a proper capitalist corporation, doing away with the small businesses. That is a principal aim, which has really got the drooling fee uh, feelings of uh, the West and the big oligarchs in Ukraine to carry that out. So that's what the battle is about, partly. It's about West having control of Ukraine's resources and using it, and using Ukraine as a bulwark against Russia to surround it further. The response of uh, Putin and his supporters is they too want to control Ukraine and maintain their position there so they can also take advantage of those resources which Ukraine has. Okay, <clears throat> thank, thank you very much, Michael. Um, <clears throat> we're we're a, a bit early. Uh, there is time if, if any comrade wants to say anything more, raise any questions, but if, that, if that's... You know, put, please put your hand up if you do. Um, okay. Well, there's nobody. There's nobody raising their hand. So, I'll. Uh, oh, hang on. Yeah, Susan. Yeah, please come in again, Susan. Yeah. Um, are you going to be doing any analysis of the extent to which the American military machine has benefited from all the? wars that it's fermented in the last 20 years you know we're talking about um you know when it flattened iraq and uh afghanistan and you know there are there are absolutely trillions that have been made and it's the cynicism of putting battle tested on their weapons and we notice that the americans were terribly keen to send their latest missiles. You know, Britain has been boasting about its anti-tank busting uh, weapons. We've also seen an odd couple of um, complaints about the deviousness of uh, Russian using, uh, I don't know if anyone came across it, the, um, they're like little dummy uh, flak that look, that has been um, evading some of the, uh, radar systems that allow them to shoot down missiles yeah so you know be, 
you based your thing on the economics and the impact of war in Ukraine on the world. And I think it has got a huge impact, but I also think that we should be looking at who benefits because qui bono is the, the ultimate analysis, yep, of this, of this particular. I agree, Susan, conflict. there's been a massive uh, increase in, I mean, first of all, the US's military spending is greater than the rest of the world put together, including yeah. China, Russia, and India, military spending. And that is the situation for the last 70 years. Yeah. Uh, since the time that President Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex, and he ought to have known as of having been the Second World War general uh, Allied commander, um, which he condemned, by the way, uh, mm -hmm. as a Republican. Um, that, but that military industrial complex has thrived and gone on indefinitely. And there are plenty of stuff to tell us about what happened in the various wars that the Americans and the coalition of the willing. Um, uh, conducted in various parts of the Middle East and uh, Asia and so on, mm. apart from the Vietnam War, of course, and before that. We can go on endlessly about the role of the American imperialism as allies in the last 70 years and how the military sector of America has benefited so dramatically from that. And the fossil fuel industry, which is the biggest polluter in the world, is the military sector. They're the yep. biggest polluter of carbon emissions in the world uh, more than anybody else, followed by the rich uh, mm. uh, and the corporations. So these things are all connected together. Uh, and they, that's not going to go away. I think the question is not only so much to, be, to want to measure how much it is, we have to say none of it is going to go away while imperialism and capitalism remains, because that is one of the, um, to use the, the acne phrase, part of the DNA of of imperialism and capitalism now, the connection between production, investment, finance, trade, and the military. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Michael. Um, Susan, do you want to come back on that at all? Uh, no, I'd, um, other than to say, I hope that we balance up the books. I hope that we look at the draining of the global south in order to feed this Mm -hmm. parasitic leech for want of a better word um but all i can see at the moment is longer bank longer queues at the food banks and more people homeless on the streets because of fuel poverty and rishi sunak boasting about how much money has been spent on beefing up the military and how terrible it is that the Tories have let us down by running down the numbers of boots on the ground, as well as the latest <laughs> wonderful weapons that we have uh, bought into. Yeah. And I think we should, we should do a cost and benefit because I don't see any benefits for the British people at all. Thank, thank you, Susan. Thank um, you. I, I, I just, I'd just like to um, throw in an, an, another couple of ideas in, into the discussion. Um, I noticed in the chat that Pam said that um, uh, Putin's not uh, not entirely rational. Um, and I, I see, think it's certainly the case that Putin um, has partly been driven to this by um, sort of his own isolation within his regime and being a bit out of touch with the real feeling on the ground in Ukraine and so on. But a, 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 another, I, I can't help thinking that another very big factor in his calculation of, of going to war in Ukraine has been the fact that there's been rebellion, in, a re revolution in Belarus, in Kazakhstan and in the Far East um, in Russian territory in the Far East, which shows the extreme instability that he's facing, the, the kind of political um, crisis in Russia. Um, and for all dictators, war is a distraction from, uh, first of all, it's a distraction from the, the issues at home. And uh, it, it, can, it can take away the, the mind of the masses from, from uh, revolution, but it's also a, a fact that he doesn't want yet another country in the periphery of Russia to be to be um, 
insurgent. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that there's a there's an intimate connection, but I mean, it, he, he's isolated, he's out of touch, but he's also scared stiff of revolution within Russia and within the peripheral countries of Russia. Um, I'm just, just throwing that in as part of the, I know it's not so much an economic factor, but it's part of the answer to the questions that have been raised. Pam, you've now got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, actually, I mean, this question about how much support he's got in Russia. Um, I've been watching uh, quite a lot of street interviews on YouTube and they're going around and asking young people mainly, you know, what they think about the situation. Do they do they think there's going to do they want the war to continue? Do they want the, the you know, the nuclear weapons to be used? And overwhelming, they're all saying no. <laughs> and I think he's just completely, completely, it's like you're saying, he's like bunker down. He's absolutely no idea what's going on under his own nose knows. I mean, I take you, I take your point in a way that he's, he's you know, he's he feel you he may feel he's been driven into this situation, but you know, it's just he's completely he just seems to be so out of touch to me. Thank you, Pam. Roger. Well, I um we're straying a little bit away from um, the topic of the economic consequences, but since um the issue has been raised, uh, I don't think um I don't think psychological analysis of the participants in the war get us very far. I think there is there is a real conflict, there are real contradictions, and there are real uh, it, this this war was building up over over a couple of decades, um, and we can't isolate it from the events. Well, from the there were two coups in which the president, the same president as it happened, were overthrown in 2004, the so-called color revolution or orange revolution. In 2014, the uh, Maidan uh, events and, uh, and the coup that took place then and so on. And I mean, it's, uh, there is a real conflict of interest. But I also agree with, um, with Ed that there are political considerations behind this. Um, in... Um, uh, first of all, of course, the uprisings in uh, Belarus and in Kazakhstan, and in um, there was one one town in um, Siberia, which for about three months was uh, was uh, in revolt and in rebellion against um, against the Putin regime, and that's one of the one of the considerations. It must be in, at least in relation to the timing of uh, of this war. And another is the manifest decline of the power of U.S. imperialism, where, where we saw, first of all, uh, U.S. imperialism had no interest in or no intention to intervene against Russia in, the, um, in terms of uh, the Syrian civil war, in, term, in terms of um, uh, uh, Chechnya, in terms of... Um, uh, what's the other issue? That Georgia. Pardon? Georgia. Georgia, exactly. The intervention in Georgia. No, no, um, they didn't, uh, they, they steered clear of any conflict or any, any intervention in those, in those uh, cases. But also, um, we see their, their complete rout. Uh, well, they, in Afghanistan, um, the, the most humiliating defeat since uh, Vietnam in the uh, in the sixties. We, but also um, the um, oh again, my, I'm just going out of my mind. Sorry. Um, the um, Af Afghanistan. I'm sorry. I have to stop now. I'm, I'm uh, not in very good form today. I'm, I'm not very well actually. That's. Oh. Thing. Oh, Sorry about that. Yeah, th th there are other issues, other points I had in mind which have escaped me. Sorry. Th thank you, Roger. Um, I, I I think we did get some of what you were trying to say, and I'm sure that the good ideas that you have in your head will be a lot clearer in a future meeting. We look forward to hearing them in a it, when you're feeling better. I'm sorry to hear you're not well, Roger. Um. Right. I think we're coming towards the end of the, the time of the meeting. Michael, would you like to say a few words in summing up? Well, I don't think so. I think I've done, spoken far too much. 
Uh, and I think we've all had a good go. I think what we should leave it with is um, there are obviously some questions we can't answer. And um, as this war unfolds, uh, we don't know how the war's going to end, but we don't know whether it will end, whether it will uh, take a, a new form. Uh, will there be an agreement between Russia, Ukraine and, and the West uh, that gets out of this war? That remains to be seen. There will be an agreement one way or another, but what sort of an agreement? Uh, when and how long will it take? Will this war be protracted? The evidence I gave in the um, uh, presentation shows that the more protracted it is, the more severe the damage is going to be to the global economy. And that is not to be dismissed. It's not, for the first time we can talk about a regional war that is actually going to hit the world globally. And this is after two other major events in the 21st century, the Great Recession and the depression that has followed since that in the world economy. So there's been hardly any improvement in the average disposable income of most workers around the country. And there's been an increase in poverty and inequality. And then the COVID pandemic, which has been the biggest slump in the uh, uh, history of capitalism for 150 years, even if it was short. So that those two things together, and now this, what could be worse uh, combination? So we face a really, really uh, frightening and difficult prospect over the next year and how this uh, war will be resolved won't be the end of the battle because of the economic imp impact it's going to have on the rest of us. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Michael. Um, and thank you all the comrades for your participation in this meeting. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to the question of um, this, this war in Ukraine at some time fairly soon in a, in a future WIN meeting. Um, the, uh, there will be a WIN meeting next Sunday. Um, at this stage, we're not quite sure 